Hey folks, Dr. Santana here. In this video, I will be providing a crash course overview of the Spanish conquest of Mexico Tenochtitlan. So as a side note, I do not cover the pre-Hispanic period in this video. Uh, that is for another video. So before moving forward, I do want to clarify that I use the term Mexico Tenochtitlan to refer to the Mexica or Aztec capital city Tenochtitlan, which was also referred to as Mexico. When I refer to the conquest of Mexico with the Nahua H inserted, I'm referring to the Spanish conquest of the Mexica. Uh, so why do I make this distinction? Well, as the authors of the text Indian Conquistadors have pointed out, there has been an erroneous tendency to refer to the Spanish conquest of the Mexica in 1521 as the, quote, conquest of Mexico. Perhaps we could say it was the conquest of Mexico, for sure. Mexico with an Nahua pronunciation. This event, right, it should be more properly referred to as the Spanish war with the Mexica or maybe the Spanish conquest of the Mexica. Not all of what we consider today that was part of that is part of the modern nation state of Mexico was under Spanish rule after 1521. Lastly, instead of the term Aztec, I defer to the term Mexica, which is also the more appropriate term. And to learn more about this, uh, check out the educational video I made on this subject. I'll place a link uh, below. Before discussing the Spanish conquest of the Mexica, it is necessary to contextualize the conquest within the broader history of European colonization and military expansion. Europe was also privy to a series of Catholic religious wars known as the Crusades, which aimed to conquer and occupy parts of Europe held by non-Christians and so-called heretics. In the latter 8th century, the Iberian kingdoms in the region that would become known as Spain and Portugal partook in a religious campaign of their own known as the Reconquista, in which they sought to reconquer territories lost previously to Muslims known as the Moors. During the Reconquista, the Spanish kingdoms eventually succeeded in the conquest of Granada, the last Muslim stronghold. In the Americas, spreading the Catholic faith would also be used as a pretext to justify the conquest and colonization of the Americas. In 1492, the same year that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue to quote a popular nursery rhyme, the crown initiated policies to expel Muslim Moors and Jews from Spain who refused to convert to Catholicism. The Iberians also utilized the Catholic Church's holy office of the Inquisition to persecute and torture suspected heretics. After the Spanish conquest of the Mexica, the Inquisition would also be brought to Mexico, which by then was known as New Spain. Thus, the Spanish crown not only sought to expand its territory, the crown also made sure to get rid of those who refused to conform to its institutions and beliefs. In sum, the period preceding the Spanish conquest of Mesoamerica was characterized by a spirit of religious fervor and violent conquest. But another motive, which I will explain next, was profit. At the turn of the 16th century, the desire to seek wealth and establish commercial ties with India also motivated European conquest, invasion, and exploration overseas. Vasco de Gama's search for an alternate route to India initiated Portuguese colonial enterprises in Africa. The Portuguese would also play a pivotal role in the colonization of the Americas by selling and supplying the Spanish and Portuguese colonies with enslaved Africans. As Portuguese navigators sought a route to India, uh, they began to establish colonies along the coasts and islands of Europe and Africa, including the Azores, Canary Islands, and Cape Verde Islands. As stated in the American Yap, this region would become the, quote, training ground for later the later colonization of the Americas. And by the way, for those of you who are educators, the American Yap is a free online U.S. history text that is composed by historians. Uh, so anyways, these island colonies were among the first where sugar was cultivated by enslaved Africans and native island populations. The new demand for sugar in Europe fueled the trade of enslaved guanches from the Canary Islands. After the guanches were decimated, they were replaced with enslaved Africans. In many ways, this outcome reflected a pattern of how the Spanish would also go on to exploit Native Americans. Spain's path to becoming a powerful empire began with Christopher Columbus's voyage and subsequent invasion of what, we be, what would be known as the island of Hispaniola. His venture, funded by the Queen and King of Castile, provided him with three ships in the hope that he would succeed in finding an alternate route to India, which eventually took Columbus and his crew to the island of Hispaniola on October 12, 1492. 
There they encounter the Tainos, who are also referred to as Arawaks or Arawaks. And these, uh, they populated the Caribbean islands. Columbus returned to Spain with enslaved and branded Tainos and promised to bring back gold and more enslaved people he referred to as Indians. During Columbus's invasion, it is estimated that at least a million Tainos died. They were subjected to slave labor and ordered to mine for gold in the rivers. If the Tainos did not meet their designated quotas, they were punished by having their hands, noses, or ears cut off. The system that the European invaders used to administer and exploit native labor was the encomienda system, which I will return to in another video. The Tainos not only died from overwork and abuse, but they were also ravaged by diseases like smallpox, which the European colonizers also brought. It should also be noted that the Tainos were not simply complacent to these abuses. Many, such as the Taino leader Hathwe, did fight back. However, Hathwe was ultimately defeated, captured, and executed. According to Bartolomé de las Casas, after refusing to convert to Catholicism, Hathwe was burned alive. This was just the early phase of Spanish colonization. Eventually, Columbus was arrested and ordered to return to Spain on charges of mismanagement. Spanish soldiers, known as conquistadors, went on to conquer the rest of the Caribbean. Notably, many of these conquistadors came to the Americas in search of wealth, gold, and glory in an effort to escape poverty and landlessness in Europe. Privately funded Spanish expeditions would lead expeditions of, uh, onto Florida, Central America, and South America. In 1517, the Spanish Cuban governor, Diego Velázquez, launched two expeditions to Yucatán. The participants of the first expedition were attacked and forced out of Yucatán. The second expedition came back with some gold, but more importantly, news of a vast empire ruled by a powerful ruler named Montezuma. Eager for more gold and riches, Governor Velázquez organized a third expedition, which was supposed to be led by... Fernando Cortés, who is also commonly known as Hernán Cortés. Notably, Cortés was a Spanish conquistador who previously supported Velázquez in the conquest of Cuba. Cortés successfully recruited men to conquer Yucatán, but Velázquez canceled the expedition and ordered Cortés's arrest. But before Velázquez's men could get to him, Cortés managed to gather 500 men, which included sailors, Cuban natives, and Africans, and sailed to Yucatán on February 18, 1519. The fugitive Cortez and his men landed on the island of Cozumel, where natives led them to Jerónimo de Aguilar, a Spaniard living among the Maya after he was shipwrecked in 1511. Aguilar was key in serving Cortez as a translator, but undeniably the most important intermediary or translator was Malincín, who was baptized as Marina by the Spanish. So who was Malincín? She was part of a noble family, but while unclear how, she was sold into slavery. Either Malincín's parents sold her or she was kidnapped. Eventually, she was purchased by Mayans from Potonchan in present-day Tabasco. After these Mayas lost a bloody battle to the Spaniards, they gave Malincín and 19 other young women to Cortez's men. Malincín proved to be a key intermediary. She served as an interpreter who spoke Maya, Nahuatl, and Spanish. Thanks to her, Cortez was able to communicate and engage with diplomacy with native elites who they met along their way to the Mexica capital. They met many key allies who were opposed to the Mexica empire, such as the Totonacs, who were tributaries that dreaded answering the Mexica's excessive demand for tribute and sacrificial victims. Through Malincín, the conquistadors also forged an alliance with the Tlaxcalans, who were renowned enemies of the Mexica. The Tlaxcalans became among the Spaniards' most formidable indigenous allies. Without the Tlaxcalans and other native allies who contributed thousands of soldiers to the ranks of Cortez's offensive forces, who, made up of, who were made up of less than 500 men, the Spanish would likely have never succeeded in conquering the Mexicas. As Cortez's forces marched to the Mexica capital of Tenochtitlan, Moctezuma Xocoyotzin, the Tlatuani, or the speaker or ruler of the Mexica, prepared reluctantly to receive Cortez and his men. While previously K-12 history textbooks propagated the myth that Moctezuma supposedly believed that Cortez and the Spaniards were gods, Historians like Camila Townsend in her article, Burying the White Gods, have since then debunked this myth. Although, unfortunately, many continue to repeat this false narrative. Eventually, the Spanish were allowed to enter the city built upon a lake, Tenochtitlan. Cortes and his 400 Spanish and 6,000 native allies 
entered the city using one of the bridges linking the mainland uh, to the capital. After Moctezuma and his nobles agreed to host the Spanish in separate quarters, Cortez and his men feared that the, that the Mexica could attack them at any moment. According to Spanish sources, Cortez took Moctezuma prisoner for plotting to massacre the Spaniards. Adding further to tensions, local priests became enraged after the Spaniards urged locals to abandon their religious practices. Later, Cortez and Moctezuma received news that a group of Spaniards from Cuba, sent by Governor Velasquez, landed on the Gulf Coast of Mexico and communicated their plans to arrest Cortes. Cortes promptly left Tenochtitlan and successfully defeated the leader of this expedition, Panfilo Narvaez, even taking out one of Narvaez's eyes in the process. Cortes then took Narvaez's men with him back to the Mexica stronghold. However, back in Tenochtitlan, Cortes left Pedro de Alvarado in charge. To say that Alvarado made tensions between the Mexica and Spanish worse is an understatement. Alvarado allowed the Mexica to conduct a ceremony known as Toshcat, which was dedicated to the deity of fire and warfare, Huitzilopochtli. But Alvarado claimed that the Mexicas had planned to kill him and his men after the ritual, Alvarado ordered an attack against the festival participants to get the upper hand. His men blocked the entrances to the ceremonial square and slaughtered Mexica nobles. As he marched back to Tenochtitlan, Cortes received word that Alvarado and his men were then driven back to their quarters by the enraged Mexicans, leaving them cornered within the Mexican capital. After the Toshcat massacre, Cortes and his men returned to Tenochtitlan, suspiciously unopposed. But the Spaniards walked into a trap and were now encircled by the Mexican adversaries. Some conquistadors claimed that Cortes used the opportunity to confront the imprisoned Moctezuma and urged him to quell his subjects. According to Spanish reports, Moctezuma went to the plaza to speak to his people but was stoned to death. However, other accounts suggest that Moctezuma was also perhaps strangled or stabbed to death. Whatever the case, the Mexica eventually succeeded in driving out the Spaniards on the morning of July 1st, 1521, in an event the Spanish remember as La Noche Triste, or the Night of Sorrow. As the Spaniards retreated in the dead of night, using the bridges that linked the Mexica capital to the mainland, they were discovered and attacked. In the aftermath, 450 of Cortez's men died. 4,000 indigenous allies perished, and 46 horses were also killed. According to indigenous accounts, the reason why so many Spaniards died was because they refused to put down the gold they sacked from the Mexican capital, which weighed them down as they sought to retreat. The Spanish would later regroup and plan another assault on the Mexica capital. This time, various factors worked in their favor. Uh, Cuitlahuac, first of all, the heir to the throne of the Mexica, had died of smallpox, and elders elected Cuauhtémoc, the young nephew of Moctezuma, to rule in his place. Smallpox also ravaged the Mexica population, resulting in an outbreak and numerous deaths. In May of 1521, the Spanish and their native allies initiated the siege of Tenochtitlan, and by August 13, 1521, they succeeded in conquering the Mexica capital. So now some concluding thoughts. Again, although this event is commonly referred to as the conquest of Mexico, we should not confuse it as signaling the conquest of the entire geographic region we refer to as Mexico today. It was the conquest of the Mexica Empire. Granted, the, this conquest did set the stage for the Spanish conquest of greater Mexico. Mexico City would go on to serve as a springboard and base of operations and reconnaissance as the Spaniards engaged in the conquest of greater Mexico, as well as modern Central America and Northern South America. However, even up to the Mexican independence period, many groups of people who lived in parts of Mexico that the Spanish Empire of New Spain laid claim to uh, many of these folks managed to live independently from Spanish rule. Some, like the Apaches, Comanches, and Yaquis, resisted the conquest. Uh, and in the next video, I will provide an overview of life, politics, and rule in colonial New Spain. So thank you for watching. And here are some of the sources that I used to relate the Spanish conquest uh, that I used to compile this mini lecture. My talking points were also based off the scattered notes that I've taken over the years. So I've also... Uh, included some works here that I did not use to compile this video as well, uh, just because I thought they might be uh, of some use uh, to those of you watching. And if you have others uh, you'd like to recommend, feel free to mention them in the comments. Thank you.